Introduction Bulgarian art director Viktor Antonov is arguably one of the most well-known designers in the modern video game industry. From Half-Life 2 to Dishonored 1, his distinctive and arresting style has left a unique mark on every game he has touched. In addition to his breathtaking vision and unique skills, Antonov is also admired for his artistic integrity, which was at the core of his highly publicized break with video game developer Valve after six years of work on essentially one project, Half-Life 2. In a 2012 interview with gaming website Eurogamer, Antonov explained, quote, I left precisely when they stopped making epic triple A's, which was Half-Life 2. Since then, they were episodes, end quote. Commenting, quote, I'm interested in projects, not in companies, end quote, Antonov said he had joined Valve, quote, specifically for Half-Life 2, end quote and then moved to Arcane Studios for The Crossing and Dishonored. In his own words, quote, I put the project above everything else, end quote. Interviews after his departure from Valve shed some light on the much-discussed question of Antonov's education, training, and the inspiration for his highly individual style. In an interview with gaming website Games Industry Biz, Antonov said, quote, I had a very rigorous school training in Art Center College of Design, California, one of the harshest schools there are, end quote. This video describes Antonov's artistic vision and inspiration, focusing in particular on one of the most influential sources for his distinctive architectural imagery, a source which Antonov never seems to have revealed publicly. This video covers these topics. 1. Antonov's artistic background. 2. An architecture. 3. Lebeus Woods, outsider architect. 4. How Antonov adapted Woods. 5. Neomechanical Tower and Twelve Monkeys. 6. After Lebeus Woods. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. This video contains some lengthy and quite dense analysis of Wood's design philosophy and work, which may not be of interest to everyone. I've arranged the content into easily navigable sections, so if you're mainly interested in learning about how Antonov was influenced by Wood's, you can use the timestamps to skip through to that content. If that's your primary interest, I would recommend the sections entitled Antonov's Artistic Background and An Architecture, both of which are quite short and provide plenty of visual comparisons between the two designers. If you're interested in an analysis of how Antonov interpreted Wood's work, I recommend the section entitled How Antonov Adapted Wood's, which is longer and contains far more detailed commentary, but will still save you a lot of time in comparison to watching the entire video. Please note that since this video is an analysis of visual design, it is focused heavily on the images which will be shown. If you are listening to this video rather than watching it, you will be able to follow the narrative, but your appreciation of the frequent visual comparisons being made may be limited by not viewing the artworks being analyzed. Antonov's artistic background. A popular Reddit Ask Me Anything thread in 2016 gave further insight into Antonov's artistic vision and personal work ethic, particularly when discussing City 17, arguably his first full-scale showcase project. Surprisingly, less attention seems to be paid to the fact that he also designed Ravenholm, one of Half-Life 2's most iconic levels. Whereas Antonov had drawn largely on Soviet-era Eastern Europe for his designs in Half-Life 2, he described his work on Dishonored as inspired by the handcrafted products of the 19th century, prior to the widespread adoption of mass production, and also based on his interest in England, commenting, quote, because England has always been a mysterious island. End quote. Antonov also described his personal motivation for the environments he built for Half-Life 2, saying he wanted to move first-person shooter games, quote, out of hallways and bunkers to take them into a strange and mysterious city setting, end quote. He added that the distinctive style of the buildings of the alien species which had invaded Earth, the Combine, quote, was inspired by brutalist totalitarian architecture, such as the Nazi and communist ones, end quote. Although brutalist architecture is typically associated with the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc nations, 
The concept and term were actually coined in 1950s Sweden and then quickly imported to England as part of the reconstruction effort after the Second World War. The bare, stark, hyper-utilitarian imagery of brutalist structures was adopted enthusiastically by Antonov and applied to the alien buildings he designed for Half-Life 2. This inspiration demonstrates Antonov's passion for basing his own architectural creations on existing structures in the real world, but also reveals his affinity for outsider art and architecture. Most interesting to me, as to others, are the specific influences on Antonov's personal style, which appears so radically different to what is commonly seen in any other video game, and which is instantly recognizable as his own. Antonov provided some useful information on this point, citing several specific individuals as particularly influential. One was industrial designer and neo-futurist Sid Mead, art designer for movies such as Tron, Blade Runner, and Aliens. It was Mead who provided the concept art for the original Blade Runner's futuristic dystopian Los Angeles, and provided an iconic design for the Voigt-Kampf machine, used to detect androids masquerading as humans. Another inspiration was architect Hugh Ferris, whose towering brutalistic building designs had an obvious attraction for Antonov. A third was Scott Robertson, a concept artist specializing in vehicle design. His stocky, aggressively styled retro-futurist buggies, cars, trucks, and aircraft were clearly an influence on the thick and thuggish vehicles Antonov designed for Half-Life 2. A fourth was concept designer Neil Page, whose extraordinary work can be seen in movies such as Minority Report, Watchmen, Oblivion, and Prometheus. Page specializes in creature weirdness, but some of his work on vehicle design for Oblivion may also have influenced Antonov. However, Antonov's architecture for Half-Life 2 in particular has certain distinctive features without a direct correspondence in the work of any of these sources. In keeping with the concept of invasion by an alien force, Antonov's artwork often displays a conflict between the very architecture of the Combine and the Earth buildings they overtake. Combine structures force themselves between, into, over, and through human structures, invading, covering, and displacing them in the process. This is not merely alien architecture. This is architecture as war. What was the inspiration for this peculiar aspect of Antonov's work? An architecture. On screen now is a collection of haunting concept art, all of which was drawn long before Antonov's work on Half-Life 2. The buildings are typically brutalist in their form, rigid, oppressive, dominating structures, dispassionately angular. Often they threaten by virtue of their sheer bulk, their vast forms looming above, with implied menace. Yet at the same time, they feel oddly distant and removed, as if the threat is entirely impersonal, even unconscious, as if they are simply unaware that we exist at all and are all the more terrifying for it. The sense of horror they evoke is produced not by a sense that they seek to harm us, but rather that they do not even acknowledge our existence. They instill fear through alienation, provoking an overwhelming sense that they are an occupying force in an environment in which we have no proper place. Although many of these structures are rigidly organized with strong linear forms suggesting deliberate planning, others seem chaotic, often almost random piles of bulk stacked haphazardly, even precariously, without concern for order. Some of these buildings often have a more organic appearance, as if they are both living and growing, yet at the same time their harsh angles and almost total lack of the softness and curves typically found in plants, makes them appear strange and unnatural, contributing further to the general alienation these structures inspire. When we do see curves, they are rarely aesthetically pleasing, often accompanying insectoid structures which sometimes seem to be vehicles. They often appear as unrestrained forms, arching massively across space, sprawling carelessly, accompanied by wildly looping cables, or aimlessly hung wires. This is an architecture. One of the most striking features of these structures is that although they are often highly detailed, frequently with many parts seemingly designed with specific intention, the actual function of the structures and their associated parts remains incomprehensible. 
Some of the structures look like they have some kind of industrial purpose, indicated by pipes, cables, and chimneys emitting clouds of vapor. Yet their function is indecipherable. Some of the structures, including a few of the vehicles, appear to have been designed for use by humans. There are occasional glimpses of platforms, often with large covers overhanging them. Sometimes there are hints of catwalks, though they seem completely inaccessible. On a few buildings, there are very obvious windows, occasionally with shutters, but their positioning is oddly erratic. A cutaway diagram of one aerial structure appears to show a long staircase inside. Yet it is connecting two complete dead ends. These buildings also lack any visible form of entry. Only rarely are there very slight suggestions, typically highly ambiguous, that there could be a way in or out. These features are always positioned so counterintuitively that it is unclear how they could have any practical use. Similarly, humans are apparently completely absent from them. However, some of the buildings have a more obvious connection with people. Occasionally, the buildings are intruding on existing human structures, piercing, overlapping, or supplanting them. Additionally, a small number of images depict human interaction with the structures. Sometimes this is extremely subtle, suggested with merely a few marks of the artist's pen. At other times, it is explicit. One shows four people apparently continuing their regular daily lives. Inside a human building, which has been partly overtaken by one of these seemingly alien structures. At bottom left, a child appears to be carrying a book. Further to the right, a figure is walking towards the wall with their back to the viewer. On the bottom right, a figure purposefully holding two sticks gazes across the room. High up on erratically positioned scaffolding near the ceiling, two figures appear to be washing fabric and hanging it to dry. Highly unusually, one image shows two people actually walking on one of these bizarre structures—a vast pile of cubist-style elements arching aggressively into the distance away from them. The couple are ascending the structure's spine from behind, though it is unclear exactly how far along they plan to walk and what their purpose could be. These images with human figures suggest a specific context for at least some of this alien architecture. A context implied by some of the other images, which also appear to have at least some association with people. One theme which is quite apparent in a number of these artworks is conflict and destruction. Many of the structures and vehicles appear warlike in nature. This is explicit in the dark, aggressively angular figures resembling helicopter gunships or stealth fighters. Sometimes it is less apparent in the form of menacing-looking structures appearing to be outposts. Watchtowers or aerial combat craft. However, it is also implicit in the appearance of many of these structures, which display obvious signs of age, wear, and damage. The damage marks on the more military-looking structures and vehicles convey strongly the sense that they have experienced warfare. One particular image, the only one of this kind I have seen, confirms this interpretation by presenting a cutaway of a military-looking vehicle showing a human figure inside. The exterior of the vehicle's lower half has been severely crushed and dented, though the human inside appears to have been protected by a curved layer of shielding. Most unusually, the human is shown with arms and legs, which are either covered with thick, form-fitting metallic armor, or have been completely replaced with robustly armored prosthetics. The face is turned away from the viewer at a three-quarter angle, but some details are visible. The face has a masculine appearance. A strong and well-defined jawline, a small brush-style moustache, and a high forehead with a receding hairline. Interestingly, the facial expression, as much as it can be seen, appears entirely placid. The figure focusing their gaze intently on a large, brightly lit screen fixed to a handle they are gripping firmly in their clenched right fist. The mundane depiction of the figure is notable. They do not present as a member of the military, who are typically clean-shaven. With closely cropped hair, this figure looks more like a civilian. There is such an extraordinary level of detail here, and so much implied narrative that this image is worth a video by itself. However, in the context of this video, any viewer even remotely figure with the Half-Life video game franchise should already be drawing a connection with the transhuman Combine soldiers, especially the Combine elite who undergo brutal bodily and mental modification 
to turn them into machine-human hybrids. Compare all these drawings with Viktor Antonov's work on Half-Life 2, and it's easy to see the resemblance. But this was not the work of Antonov. This art was drawn by a very specific architect with no connection at all to the video game industry, long before Half-Life 2 was released. Lebeus Woods, Outsider Architect Welcome to the dystopian world of Lebeus Woods. Although this image on screen now may look like a scene straight out of Half-Life 2, it's actually a sculpture by Woods made long before Half-Life 2 was on the drawing board. It's a work by Woods called The Hermitage, created in 1998. Born in 1940, Woods studied architecture and engineering. Despite never receiving a formal qualification in architecture, he referred to himself consistently as Lebeus Woods' architect and actually taught as professor of architecture at the privately funded Cooper Union in New York and the European Graduate School in Switzerland. In 1976, Woods appears to have abandoned conventional architecture and devoted himself entirely to experimentalism and conceptual art. However, this did not mean he had ceased designing practical structures. In an interview with the New York Times in 2008, he insisted, quote, I am not interested in living in a fantasy world. All my work is still meant to evoke real architectural spaces, end quote. Rather, he said his shift in focus was intended to illustrate, quote, what the world would be like if we were free of conventional limits, end quote, and, quote, what could happen if we lived by a different set of rules, end quote. His interest in the more fantastic is reflected in some of his less commonly known illustrative work around this time. A blog post by online gallery and bookstore Ruins or Books explains that, quote, prior to his wider recognition as an architect and theorist, Lebeus Woods provided illustrations for several works of science fiction, end quote, citing a cover he designed for a special edition of Arthur C. Clarke's novella The Sentinel in 1983. These sci-fi illustrations by Woods differ significantly from his An Architecture, particularly in their depiction of humans. But of course, they were created for a very different purpose. Nevertheless, his distinctive style remains highly obvious, especially in his depiction of vehicles and buildings. However, in his sci-fi art, his presentation of humans, or at least human figures, spans a wide spectrum from the mundane to the grotesquely nightmarish. Another opportunity for sci-fi work came in 1990, when Woods was hired as a concept artist on the first draft of Alien 3. The director at that time was Vincent Ward, whose vision for the movie was very different to the final version under David Fincher. Ward's movie had an architectural centerpiece which appealed greatly to Woods, a planet with underground structures made from wood, home to a religious colony of primitivists who had forsaken modern technology. In a blog post in 2009, Woods reflected briefly on the plot and his concept designs, some of which he displayed, while warning his readers, quote, the drawings made by me that I reproduce with this post and their copyrights are the property of the 20th Century Fox Film Corporation, end quote, citing fair use legislation as his justification for displaying them on his blog. It's worth pausing to reflect for a moment on the ethical dilemmas of intellectual property law especially when they deprive artists of unrestricted use of their own creations. Woods was clearly unimpressed by Fincher's rendition of Alien 3, calling it, quote, notable for its unremarkable sets and its unrelenting grimness, end quote. He was much more enthusiastic about Ward's concept, very obviously due to its architectural set piece, which would give Woods' imagination opportunity for full expression. Inspired by the fact that the tertiary characters in Ward's movie had, in Wood's words, quote, adopted a medieval way of life without electricity or modern technology, end quote, Woods designed a cathedral-like building which, although obviously drawing on Gothic architecture of the Middle Ages, nevertheless also featured his own structure's distinctively gargantuan, oppressive, and alien features. Wood's personal philosophy with regard to architecture is best summarized by a manifesto he wrote in 1993 and which he had read publicly by two actors in Sarajevo in November of the same year. In a blog post written in 2011, Woods recorded that at the time, quote, the city was under attack, end quote, 
adding that the manifesto was read, quote, in full view of Serbian snipers and artillery gunners, end quote. Fortunately, he assures readers, no one in the audience, which included Woods himself, was harmed. Widely cited quotations from Woods' manifesto include the statements, quote, architecture and war are not incompatible. Architecture is war. War is architecture, end quote. These concepts can be seen clearly in his visual designs. The manifesto contains themes and statements which seem to echo deconstructivism. Woods appears to express sympathy with the postmodern movement with his declaration, quote, I declare war on all icons and finalities, on all histories that would chain me with my own falseness, my own pitiful fears, end quote. Indeed, some famous deconstructivist architect appears quite similar to Woods' own work. However, writing in the online periodical The Third Rail, architectural planner Joshua Johnson notes Woods, quote, distance himself from the label deconstructivism, end quote. While acknowledging Woods' work, quote, was often associated with deconstructivism, end quote, Johnson argues, quote, Woods was more properly a constructivist, end quote. This is also seen clearly in Woods' manifesto. When describing himself, Woods writes, quote, I am an architect, a constructor of worlds, end quote, and concludes his document with the declaration, quote, tomorrow we begin together the construction of a city, end quote. As a result of his visit to Sarajevo, Woods published his manifesto, a collection of architectural concept drawings on the theme of reconstructing Sarajevo after the war, and an accompanying commentary explaining his design philosophy in the 15th issue of Pamphlet Architecture, a periodical in which architects presented their designs, work, and personal thoughts. However, years later, writing on his blog in 2011, he expressed regret over this work, saying that in reflection he found it, quote, inadequate in its explanation of what inspired the designs, drawings, and models, and what I hope to achieve by making them, end quote. Interestingly, he also noted that his work on Sarajevo had been, quote, accused of aestheticizing violence and merely being exploitative of a tragic human condition, end quote. Instead of defending himself against this charge, Woods acknowledged its legitimacy, writing, quote, I failed to put the work in the broader human context that it needed to be understood as proposals for architecture serving rational and needed purposes, end quote. This provides a deep insight not only into Wood's process of self-reflection and capacity for accepting criticism, but also his intellectual honesty, and perhaps most importantly of all, his sensitivity and his personal ethics. This last point is particularly significant in the context of interpreting his work. As we shall see, this would not be the last time his designs were construed as implying violence or containing conflict themes, which he never intended. Wood's style is as consistent as it is distinctive. In the overwhelming majority of his concept designs, he is indeed building a city, and unsurprisingly in light of his inspiration by war-torn Sarajevo, it's a city in an entire world with a very clearly defined context. The theme of war is pervasive in nearly every work, the architecture itself illustrating a battle between opposing forces. As we have seen, recurring themes include massive over-engineering, redundantly numerous cables, long and twisted pipes with no apparent purpose, heavy angular blocks stacked and overlapped, and a parsimonious use of curves. You will note the very strong similarities to the architecture in Half-Life 2. As we have also seen, another repeated motif is buildings being pierced, covered, or displaced by architecture which seems unnatural. In some cases, it looks like the two structures themselves are at war with each other, while in others, it seems a parasitic alien structure is gradually supplanting a human host building. This is also imagery seen in Half-Life 2. In case there are any lingering doubts, let's now look at two independent sources of information which prove that Antonov was indeed inspired by Woods. In 2015, a user on Quora named Steve Theodore replied to the question, quote, did the architecture of Lebeus Woods inspire the level design in Half-Life 2? End quote. Identifying himself as a game developer who previously worked for Valve, the company which produced the Half-Life franchise, 
Theodore wrote, quote, I remember seeing a Lebeus Woods book around the office between 2000 and 2002, although I think it belonged to Greg Kuma, not Victor, or maybe to Ted Backman. I'd be surprised, though, if Victor never saw it, end quote. An even more conclusive reference is found in a comment on one of Woods' blog posts from six years earlier, in 2009. The commenter, identified only as Jonathan, wrote directly to Woods, saying, quote, I spoke with Viktor Antonov at the time he was with Valve a few years ago at SIGGRAPH after he gave a preview of his work on Half-Life 2, and he directly cited your work, Labea's work, as inspiration in his process. End quote. It should be understood that I am not presenting the connection between Woods and Antonov as my own discovery or as a groundbreaking revelation. Quite apart from the very clear statements I've just cited, recognition of Woods' inspiration of Antonov can be found online in various social media spaces. In fact, in 2016, I made a post about it myself in an online forum for computer geeks. In 2015, a post on Valve's Steam community forums commenting on an update to Half-Life 2 observed that despite the commentary provided on the game's architectural design, Valve had made, quote, no mention of Lebeus Woods, an American architect from Michigan whose art is the primary inspiration for all the combined architecture and vehicle design, end quote. Adding, quote, he deserves recognition for giving the game so much of its artistic style, end quote. In 2014, a reply on the Quora website by commentator Roman Tibolt answering the question, quote, did the architecture of Lebeus Woods inspire the level design in Half-Life 2, end quote, stated, quote, some of his work leaves little to no doubt about its influence on Half-Life 2, end quote, proposing, quote, Antonov may have studied Woods' work as a student in the Art Centered College of Design, end quote. In 2017, a poster on the R Half-Life subreddit uploaded an image of one of Woods' designs, commenting that it reminded them of the Combine synths and Citadel in Half-Life 2, and adding, quote, I would not be surprised if Valve took heavy inspiration from his work, end quote. In March 2020, a poster on the R Half-Life subreddit uploaded an image showing one of Woods' drawings next to a screenshot from Half-Life 2 with the title, quote, Labeus Woods' influence over Half-Life 2's architecture, end quote. In July 2020, a poster on the R Half-Life subreddit uploaded an image from Half-Life Alex, the most recent episode in the Half-Life franchise, with the title, quote, Can we just appreciate how completely alien combined architecture looks and feels? End quote. Two commentators immediately noted the resemblance to Wood's drawings, one of them writing, quote, City 17 was inspired by architect Lebeus Woods, end quote, adding, quote, His work also inspired some dishonored environments, end quote. So the similarity between Woods and architecture and Antonov's work on Half-Life 2 has been recognized for some time, though there still appears to be surprisingly little commentary on the relationship between the two, even in social media discourse. Of greater interest to me is the fact that interpretations of Woods' work are so consistent. Commenters write that Woods' structures are exactly what we find in Half-Life 2. Alien architecture, invasive structures, parasitic buildings, seemingly resulting from an invasion of Earth by otherworldly beings. However, this is a misleading result of interpreting Antonov's work first and then reading that interpretation back into Woods' designs. Surprisingly, Woods and architecture has a very different context and meaning to the structures in Half-Life 2. In order to appreciate this, we must now look at how Antonov himself adapted Woods' canon of work. How Antonov Adapted Woods Woods' self-awareness is visible in a blog post he made in 2007 entitled Outsider Architecture, in which he wrote that over the years he had been thinking about, quote, architects who have produced works of various kinds outside the mainstream certified by the historians and critics who make up architectural academia or otherwise influence the climate of opinion, end quote. This might seem ironic coming from a man whose own work would certainly fit most people's definition of outsider architecture, and indeed this was not lost on Woods, who added, quote, to some degree my thinking was prompted by my own work and where it might be placed in today's critical categories, end quote. An article in the New York Times a year later echoed these sentiments, opening with the statement, quote, 
These are lonely times for Lebeus Woods, end quote. The article cited his earlier work in the 1990s, which gained him a cult following, before commenting, quote, Since then, Mr. Woods has become his own kind of outcast, end quote. Wood's post about outsider architecture is important not only because it demonstrates his own awareness of the position of his work in the broader context of the industry and his own isolation from it, but also because it illustrates his curiosity about how his work would ultimately be interpreted by others. This was an important consideration for Woods, who had previously been upset by serious misinterpretations of his work and may have been concerned that his artistic legacy would be tainted by these false views. If this is indeed true, then his concern was well-founded. Although Wood's artistic style was indirectly brought to a far wider audience through Antonov's use of it in Half-Life 2, Antonov's interpretation of Wood's has led people to misunderstand Wood's art as conveying the same meaning as Antonov's. There is no confusion over the symbolism of Antonov's structures in Half-Life 2. The story's narrative of Earth invaded and enslaved by oppressive extraterrestrial beings called the Combine provides a context informing the viewer's interpretation of Antonov's architectural designs. In an article in 2019, visual design specialist David Edwards posted a lengthy commentary on the meaning of Antonov's artwork in Half-Life 2, noting that the Combine's, quote, all-consuming steel walls are literal and metaphorical extensions of the occupying alien force's gradual consumption and assimilation of our species' culture." End quote. This use of architecture as a visual metaphor for dispassionate invasion, oppression, and parasitism has been identified by gamers themselves. A post on the Half-Life subreddit commented that the Combine architecture, quote, just adds itself to human architecture with no regard for it at all, end quote, observing how, quote, Bridges crash through walls, and those citadel power stations are just dropped on top of buildings. End quote. Wood's own architectural illustrations have been interpreted in the same way, with some commentators speculating on possible personal reasons for his distinctive designs. An article on the architecture blog Ideas for Philanthropists in 2017 notes that Wood's father died from a form of blood cancer and suggests that, quote, the idea of this invasive disease originating from the inside, spreading and radiating out, could have stayed with Woods and influenced the development of the parasitic architecture evident in his drawings. End quote. Understanding the explicitly parasitic nature of Antonov's combine structures in Half-Life 2 and his brutalist style buildings representing oppressive dystopianism in the video game Dishonored by Arcane Studios has led other commentators on Wood's work to assume it has the same meaning. A 2009 paper in Loading, the journal of the Canadian Game Studies Association, comments on the architecture of Dishonored as symbolic of the rule of the city of Dunwall's totalitarian dictator, saying, quote, Dunwall Tower is transformed during his rule, being heavily clad with jagged metallic structures, evocative of the works of architect Lebeus Woods, end quote. The authors interpret what they refer to as, quote, this architectural transformation, end quote, as a metaphor for, quote, the perversion of authority brought about by Burroughs' morals and personality, end quote. In the core comment cited previously in this video, Roman Tybalt draws parallels between the combined structures in Half-Life 2 and the architecture of Lebeus Woods, writing that they both depict, quote, dystopian settings and the study of systems in a state of crisis, end quote. He also drew a parallel between Wood's concept of, quote, architectural elements that adapt and blend to their environment, end quote, and Half-Life 2's combine, and how, quote, and how this, quote, alien invasion and occupation force adapt their technology to Earth resources and ecosystems, end quote. It should be recognized that this does seem to be implied by some of the titles Wood gave to his work. On screen now is a work Wood's entitled Injection Parasite Sarajevo. It shows a modern skyscraper in a damaged state with vast metal structures which not only cover part of its exterior, but which also transfix it at several points, entering from one side, passing through the body of the building, and exiting the other. The word injection very obviously refers to the way the secondary structures have pierced through the building, and the word parasite is indisputably negative, conveying the sense of a hostile organism which has invaded a host and is preying on it.
This is certainly the interpretation of Woods and architecture on which Antonov based his own work and remains a widespread interpretation of Woods among the broader public, especially among gamers who encounter Woods' drawings after having played Half-Life 2. Woods' art has certainly been widely understood as not merely deconstructive, but destructive, as well as pessimistic and nihilist. An article in the New York Times noted that some of his work had been criticized for its, quote, cold-blooded imagery, end quote, while the 2017 article on the Ideas for Philanthropists blog observes his drawings have been criticized as, quote, aestheticizing violence, end quote. However, this is very far from Wood's personal vision. In a Eurogamer online article entitled The Impossible Architecture of Video Games, games journalist Ewan Wilson makes the thoughtful comment that, quote, his visions were of a form of creative destruction. Out of chaos could spring newly invigorated forms, end quote. Incisively, Woods observes that this perspective still has its negative elements, noting that, quote, Half-Life 2 leans on the dystopian quality of this idea, but the combined infectious architecture is no less arresting, end quote. Here, Wilson intuitively grasps the fact that Antonov was not merely taking inspiration from Woods, he was also interpreting him. Whereas Woods saw his work as inherently positive, a form of architectural restoration from destruction and wreckage, Antonov, by placing the same imagery in a different context, rendered it entirely negative, parasitic, predatory, and oppressive. A blog post by Aaron Cote on the Bridge Waterloo Architecture website, part of the University of Waterloo School of Architecture, not only sees past the hostile implications of the combine architecture in Half-Life 2, but also notes the human resistance movement in the game using the same architectural principles. Cote writes, quote, The combine and the resistance both appear to hold true to an architectural style that implies adapting old materials to suit new purposes, end quote citing several instances visible in the game. This insight reaches through Antonov's interpretation to Wood's original vision of architecture as restoration of war-torn buildings reconstructed and patched using repurposed material from both themselves and irreparable structures. In the New York Times article cited previously, Nikolai Orosov rightly describes Wood's art as depicting, quote, bombed-out cities populated by strange parasitic structures, they seem to portray a world in a perpetual state of war, end quote, but thoughtfully adds that this is also a world, quote, in which the architect's task was to create safe houses for society's outcasts, end quote. This is indeed Wood's original vision, and one which is not entirely lost in Antonov's interpretation, as we have seen Cote perceive. In Half-Life 2, the resistance are indeed seeking to create safe houses for society's outcasts, using the very materials of the structures destroyed by the alien invaders. Previously, I noted the almost complete absence of humans from Wood's artwork, with very few exceptions, including a number of images in which people appear to be making their best effort to continue normative life among the wreckage of conflict and destruction. The 2017 blog post on the Ideas for Philanthropists website makes the same observation, saying, quote, at first, the lack of people depicted in Wood's drawings appears to contradict all his arguments of designing architecture for people, end quote, before suggesting a reason for this absence. The article proposes that Wood's, quote, does not want to formulate how people should live in the worlds he imagines, but just create a different architecture that has the potential to reinvent how people could live, end quote. This is an architecture, the concept of structures which serve a purpose for those that use them but which does not impose on them or constrain their behavior beyond certain aspects of basic practicality. This is an incisively accurate interpretation of Wood's philosophy. In a 2014 conference paper, art historian Dr. Mark Bonner, lecturer for media studies at the University of Cologne, observed that in Half-Life 2, quote, the combine's parasitic architecture eats its way through the historical building structures of the city, end quote adding that the great citadel in the game appears to be, quote, a mix of Lebeus Wood's concepts and a bayonet-like Shtiki monument erected near Zelenograd in 1974 in remembrance of the defenders of Moscow, end quote. This is certainly an excellent explanation of the function of combine architecture in Half-Life 2, exhibited most powerfully in the combine smart barrier. These stark, spartan, 
brutalist structures are a kind of mechanized wall which gradually advances over the city, covering, crushing, and displacing human buildings in the process. The Combine Smart Barrier was obviously inspired by woods and architecture, but despite all appearances, the invasive parasitic architecture in woods designs is not intended to be an alien intrusion or destructive force. Instead, it is a human construction made from the ruins of buildings destroyed by war, used to patch, heal, and restore a city's remaining buildings. They are a form of scar tissue, both a visible record of the conflict and a way to heal from it. In a 2014 article appropriately entitled Scars in the online magazine Song Bleu, Helen Levin describes how this form of restoration was inspired by Wood's experiences in the ruins of Sarajevo. Woods and architecture, Levin explains, is a way to remove power from the authoritarian social hierarchies responsible for the war and empower the individual survivors who construct their own buildings suited specifically for their own needs. As Levin puts it, quote, the anarchy would emerge through the desire to build a city for oneself, by oneself, from the discarded remnants of the established violent government, end quote. This is explained in various posts on Wood's own blog, especially a post in 2011 entitled, quote, War and Architecture, Three Principles, in which he provides images of his anarchitected designs and explains their meaning. On screen now is one of these images, which Woods describes as, quote, a typical residential block, badly damaged in places, reconstructed with new types of spaces for residents' use, end quote. He adds that this form of reconstruction, quote, integrates people's experiences of the destruction into needed social changes, as well as architectural ones, end quote. Under an image of his design for a new parliament building, Woods wrote, quote, the purpose of the new parliament is not simply to replace the old socialist parliament, but in the first place to study and debate what a post-war Bosnian parliament should be and do, end quote. Levin's article comments that Woods, quote, saw the potential for healing the trauma through architecturally mending the city, end quote. This is why the architecture in his buildings shows signs of age and conflict and appears parasitic and predatory. In reality, it is only parasitic in the sense that it is sustained by the structures to which it is attached. It is best described as scar tissue. In his 1997 work, Radical Restoration, Woods says, quote, the scar is a deeper level of reconstruction that fuses the new and the old, end quote, adding it is, quote, a mark of pride and of honor, both for what has been lost and what has been gained, end quote. He further describes this architectural scarring as, quote, a mutant tissue, the precursor of unpredictable regenerations, end quote. The important fact to recognize here is that Wood's original concepts and designs arose in a different context to Antonov's, and are in fact far more hopeful and positive. These two different contexts help us understand both why and how Antonov's interpretation of woods and architecture not only resembles it so strongly, but also departs from it in significant ways. In his 2014 conference paper, art historian Mark Bonner notes this distinction between woods and Antonov, writing, quote, while woods thought of his structures as overcoming outdated hierarchies and fatal harm, Antonov uses them as architecture representing fear and dominance of an occupier or of an aristocracy, end quote. Bonner continues explaining that, quote, rather than closing wounds in an architecture or expanding buildings, Antonov's architectures sit on existing structures like a parasite, end quote, adding that Antonov's dystopian combine structures, quote, represent a new authority, opening up new wounds rather than closing them, end quote. Neomechanical Tower and Twelve Monkeys. Lebeus Wood's work was indisputably the most influential inspiration on Antonov's work on Half-Life 2. Yet Antonov never mentions him even when discussing the various influences on his own work. Is it because he was influenced very early in his career and simply forgot about this inspiration later? Or is it possible that he is deliberately avoiding any association of this source with his own work? Perhaps the answer lies in an iconic scene from the 1995 Terry Gilliam movie, Twelve Monkeys. On screen at left, we see Lebeus Wood's work, entitled 
neo-mechanical tower, upper chamber, originally drawn in black and white in 1987, then colored and published in a collection of Wood's art in 1992. On screen at right, we see a scene from Terry Gilliam's 1995 movie, 12 Monkeys. The source of Gilliam's scene is obvious. Wood's work was copied without his permission. Consequently, Woods brought a lawsuit against the movie's distributor, Universal Pictures, demanding the scene be removed. The judge ruled in favor of Woods, who subsequently settled with Universal for a six-figure sum in exchange for permitting the scene to be included. In a blog post in 2009, Woods expressed satisfaction that the judge's ruling, quote, has become part of federal case law in the United States, end quote, and that his case was now being used as a precedent to protect the creative rights of, quote, artists, architects, and designers who believe that they have a legitimate claim of copyright infringement, end quote. Is this lawsuit the reason why Antonov has typically remained silent on Wood's work as an inspiration for his own? Despite the clear similarity of Antonov's design vision to Wood's and architecture, there was no lawsuit. Maybe Woods didn't think Antonov had copied anything too blatantly. Maybe he was content that Antonov's interpretation of his work was consistent with his personal vision. Maybe Half-Life 2 just wasn't on his radar. But Woods was certainly on Antonov's radar. I used to believe there was a good case to be made that Antonov kept Woods carefully in the background, even in interviews and discussions specifically asking about the inspiration of his work, just in case Woods decided Antonov was taking too much license. It would at least be some explanation for the curious fact that Antonov has never publicly recognized his most significant inspiration. However, these days I'm no longer convinced of that. I'm still not sure if Woods ever knew of how Antonov drew on his work. There doesn't seem to be any mention of Antonov or the game on Woods' own blog, which is very curious to me, and even interviews with Woods as late as 2007 don't reveal any evidence that Woods knew anything about Antonov or Half-Life 2, or how Woods inspired both. However, although Antonov's designs were inspired by, and to some extent derivative of, Woods, Antonov's own work certainly was not in the same category as Universal Studios' complete appropriation. After reading Woods' own comments on the architects and conceptual artists who inspired him, and identifying elements of their own work in Woods' own creations, I believe Woods would have been entirely comfortable with how his canon influenced Antonov, and even how it was reinterpreted. More interesting to me is speculation on how Woods would have viewed Antonov's art, and if Antonov actually misunderstood Woods and architecture as alien, destructively parasitic, and predatory, or if Antonov interpreted Woods correctly and simply chose to apply his imagery in a different context. Since Woods died in 2012, unless Antonov chooses to talk about it, we may never know. After Labeus Woods. Like Woods, Antonov's work has left a legacy in the video game franchises to which he contributed significantly. Despite leaving Valve after Half-Life 2, Antonov's distinctive vision for combine architecture is clearly visible in Half-Life 2 episodes 1 and 2, as well as in Half-Life Alex, the latest installment in the franchise. Likewise, Despite leaving Arcane Studios after his work on Dishonored, Antonov's art style, and in particular his architecture, was preserved faithfully in the later games in the franchise Dishonored 2 and Death of the Outsider. However, despite his death in 2012, Woods himself continues to inspire and influence video game architectural design. One recent example is the video game Afterlight, which has been in development by Silent Road Studios since 2018. In an article on the gaming website 80 Level, the Silent Road Studios team not only described the game's architecture as taking inspiration from Wood's manifestos, but also explained how their game's narrative follows Wood's theme of, quote, the matter of struggle and the scars and marks the conflict leaves on things, end quote. Very importantly, they recognized the distinction between Wood's own understanding of his architecture and Antonov's interpretation of it, writing, quote, We have taken a lot from Antonov's interpretation of Wood's, like the parasite relationship between humanity and the aliens. The scars of the conflict are the alien shapes and alien technologies. 
over the human cities, end quote. However, in a unique extension of Antonov's interpretation, the Afterlight team explained how they, quote, reimagined this concept in order to put humanity on the parasite side as a conqueror of nature on Titan, end quote. Consequently, in Afterlight, quote, Lebeus architecture turns humanity into a scar over nature in the conflict of colonization, end quote. This is an application of Woods and architecture which is highly congruent with his own principles. It is very likely he would have been delighted to see his work not only interpreted accurately and sympathetically, but extended thematically and applied to socially relevant topics of discourse such as colonization. Conclusion. This examination of the connection between the works of Lebeus Woods and Victor Antonov has sought to present Woods and architecture in its original context and correct misunderstandings of it resulting from familiarity with Antonov's interpretation. In the process, this video has attempted to raise greater awareness of Woods, his design philosophy, and the deeply sensitive humanity from which it emerged. Originally, I hoped that this video would help answer the question, why has Antonov never revealed Woods as an influential source on his own work? Unfortunately, I was simply unable to answer this question, and without information from Antonov himself, it may never be answered. Perhaps it will be answered one day by someone else. The fantastic designs of Lebeus Woods have inspired many other artworks, and similarities have been identified in his art and several other video games in recent years. I hope you'll be inspired by this video to look for those similarities yourself and gain a deeper appreciation of this extraordinary outsider architect. Finally, I'd like to thank my generous patrons, Dusty Bob, The Boots Are On, Elias Asvig, Duren Barnett, Alexander Curzon, Sean A. Young, Andy Chaos, TVLTP, Thors, Fake Name, Niels Rethelin, Judge Sabo, Matthew Simmerall, Martin T, Ben Lindquist, John Larkin, Jack C, Ezekiel Stacy, Love You More, Noah French, and Aaron Johnson. Please contact me if I ever pronounce your name incorrectly. <laughs>